good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. Let's stand and worship. morning church. My weapon is a melody. 
God this morning. Let's give him praise, church. This morning we're going to do a new song called The Truth, and as always, as you feel comfortable, we just ask that you join in singing and declaring this song. In John, it talk, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, believers all across the world and people who are searching are asking for that. What is the truth? What is that capital T truth? And we know that the truth is Jesus and will always be Jesus Christ.
praise you. We count it as joy all the battles we face in life because we know that even though they come and will come, you are there with us in the fire. You will never leave us or forsake us. You never have and you never will. We praise you for that, Lord Jesus. We praise you for what you did on the cross and what you continue to do today. You are our Savior and worthy of all praise. We just pray this day that you stand with us in our fires, that you stand with us in times of joy and in times of trouble. And we know that we can count on you to do that. Thank you, Jesus, for that. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're glad we were able to worship with you this morning, church. Very good to see you all. Please take a moment and say hello to one another. Good morning, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Mark Burfield. I am one of our Wednesday night uh, children's ministry volunteers, and I would just like to say good morning and happy Father's Day to everyone. You guys respond so much better than the kids on Wednesday nights. That's awesome. <laughs> I have been asked to announce the announcements that need uh, announcing, so with that, we will begin. Our first announcement is for this Wednesday night. Point Man Youth will be having a campfire at 7 p.m. Um, so please uh, bring your, your kids 6th grade to, to 12th, correct? Yep. Um, campfires are fun, so there's our first announcement. Second, the American Red Cross Blood Drive is coming this Tuesday to the Church of the Good Shepherd. It will be from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. here at the church. To schedule an appointment, go to redcrossblood.org. And where it asks for a sponsor code, put in Good Shepherd. That's the gift that keeps giving, please, everyone. If you can, please come and give. Uh, baptism Sunday is coming up. It is July 18th. Sign up is at the Welcome Center if you would like to get baptized. The Welcome Center is between these two doors, straight out. Next announcement is Impact Summer Camp Parent and Student Meeting is coming up on Wednesday, June 30th at 7 p.m. in the Youth Building out back. This meeting is for all students, parents of students attending, and parents that are attending the camp also. So please, come to the meeting. They have lots of information for you. Our last, uh, our last offering, our last announcement, excuse me, is the Pemberville Parade Float building team is looking for more volunteer members. If you would like to help build this year's float, the sign-up is at the Welcome Center. Again, between the two doors, straight out. We'd appreciate any and all help we can get on that. It's short this year, short notice, and more hands make lighter work. With that, we're going to take up our offering next. Um, we have plenty of ways for tithing and offering. We have the old-fashioned way of the baskets at the doors. You can physically put your, your offerings in. And then we have, um, everything's behind me, yep. We have the Download the Church app, Church Center app. You can text the amount to 84321, or you can go to www.cgs.church and click on the giving tab. While we make our offerings, we're going to say a quick little prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this time to gather together. We pray that our offerings and tithings are pleasing to you. And Lord, we just pray for guidance in our leadership to take these offerings and just use them as best as possible in furthering your kingdom. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I guess we have a nice little Father's Day video for you guys to watch now. So please enjoy and enjoy your day. Sometimes I wonder where I'd be without you. Would I understand life? Would I make right choices? Would I live out my faith? 
Thank you for showing me what it means to love God and for giving me your all, even when it was difficult. Thank you for the discipline I deserved and the grace I didn't, and for being present, even though you had so much on your plate. Thank you for picking me up and encouraging me to try again, and for the little life lessons I still lean on today. The truth is, I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for you. As I look back on my life, I see moment after moment where your influence, your wisdom, and your strength made all the difference. Thank you for loving me. Today, I give thanks. Today, I am grateful. Today, I celebrate you. I love you, Dad. Well, happy Father's Day. So I just want to say happy Father's Day to all the, the dads today and uh, just appreciate the roles that you play in your children's lives. Uh, our kids need godly fathers, amen? And need godly mothers, godly fathers, and people that they can look up to. So happy Father's Day. Uh, I want to welcome you to Church of Good Shepherd. My name is Brad Keen. I am the lead pastor here. Uh, if you are a guest, thank you for uh, worshiping with us this morning. If you're online, uh, thank you for tuning in as well. And uh, again, if you can give blood uh, this Tuesday, please do so. There's still a few spots that are remaining, and I uh, would just love it if you were able to, to come on out and to, uh, to give blood this week. So uh, we would uh, appreciate that. All right, well, we are going to uh, pray, and we're going to begin our service this morning. And uh, my dad is asking for prayers, so he has actually spent the last couple days in the hospital and uh, had a surgery last night and spent the next couple days in there before he's better. So not quite the Father's Day he or I were uh, expecting, and, uh, but he's on the mend, hopefully, and he'll have to have a, another procedure here in a couple weeks. But uh, he's on the mend and, and hopefully getting better, but just keep him in, uh, in, uh, in your thoughts and prayers because uh, they don't allow visitors yet, and then obviously with mom passing this, this last January, kind of there by himself. Actually had the surgery real quick last night, and I sat there going, well, how am I going to find out when this is done? So, because uh, it was real quick, they had to get him in. But uh, anyways, just going to pray for him as well, and I know our prayer team's been praying for him, and, uh, and just lift up everyone that has prayer needs, and, and uh, so let's do that this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and God, we're so thankful for all the fathers. God, we're so thankful for those that have um, chose to raise their kids to know you and set that godly example. And, and Lord, we pray for those that might not be biological fathers, but they've taken the time to mentor and to take a child underneath their wing that maybe didn't have a father, and they are just as much of a father. God, we're so thankful for those godly examples as well. Lord, we pray for uh, all those that have needs this morning, those that are here, those that are watching online. Uh, God, if they're watching from a hospital room, if they're watching from their home, God, we pray that you touch their bodies, that you'd heal them, that you'd restore them. Pray for, for my dad this morning, for Kevin, Father God, that you'd touch his body, that you'd heal him, that you'd restore him, uh, that you'd encourage him this morning. And uh, even as he spends a Father's Day in the hospital, Lord, there's, there's many people that are. And so, God, we pray that you'd lift them up, that you'd encourage them. God, that you'd meet us all right where we're at this morning. Uh, Lord, everyone comes in this morning in a different place. Some are in good places, some are in not so good places. Uh, Lord, some of us have challenges before us. And God, we're just so thankful that you'll meet us where we're at. God, that you'll speak to us this morning, that you reveal yourself to us, and that we'll all walk away with that nugget of truth from Scripture that you have for us this morning. God, we pray that you bless this time as we dig into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, this is week four in our series that we've been doing in Daniel. This is probably going to be uh, our last week, uh, at least for now, in this series. Um, you know, there's several more dreams that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to have, and, and there's some pr prophetic things that go on through uh, this book. Daniel and the Lion's Den is like the next really big story. And, uh, and I did that story last year when I was talking about some heroes in the faith. And, and uh, so I'm not going to redo that again. Uh, it would fit in nice with this series, but there's so many good 
things to teach from in Scripture. I'm not going to go back and, and, uh, and redo that story uh, right now at this time. So this is probably going to be our last week uh, in, in Daniel right now. These are really the three chapters that God uh, laid on my heart. So what we've done so far is we've looked uh, at the fact that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they were taken as captives. They were made slaves uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar. They're marched hundreds of miles away from home. Uh, their, their, their identities are actually changed. They're given new names. They're put into uh, the king's uh, royal service. And then in the last couple of weeks, we looked at the dreams that King Nebuchadnezzar had had, and his wise men, magicians, astrologers uh, could not interpret these dreams, and so he gave the death penalty for all of these people uh, throughout the kingdom to die, and so that included Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and Daniel, having favor with the king, went back to him and said, hey, can you give us a little more time, and so what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel did is instead of saying, you know, life is unfair, why would God do this to us, we've been faithful, we've done all these other things, uh, we, we've put our life on the line before for the Lord. Uh, what they did is they went deeper with God. And so we looked at that last week. And that's, that's such an important thing to do in our lives is to go deeper with God when we're facing trials in our life and, and not to throw up our hands in discouragement. We can be discouraged. We're going to feel discouraged at times. But they went deeper with God. They went deep with God in prayer. And what did God do? God showed up, amen? And, and God met them right where they're at. And God will meet us where we're at. So God reveals what the dream was to Daniel. Then he gives them uh, the interpretation of the dream so that he could give that uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I'm not going to go through anything else uh, with that story. You can go online. You can watch it on our, our Facebook page. You can go to our church website. You can go to our YouTube channel. You can watch any of the sermons uh, from this series or any other series. And uh, so just encourage you to go on there and do that. And, and if you're going to do that stuff too, I just encourage you guys like with Facebook and things like that, when you like our posts, share our posts as well. So we've got the, the big car show thing coming up this fall, and we got the blood drive stuff. When you see our stuff, feel free to share it on your page, and that way the word uh, gets out, and you can share our Sunday morning sermons uh, and stuff as well. So uh, always feel free. We'd love it if you guys would do that. So you can check out the, the past part, the last three weeks on there. All right, chapter three. We're going to dig into that this morning. It is an exciting chapter. Uh, it's a chapter uh, that's filled with incredible suspense. Uh, we're going to see some amazing faithfulness. And we're going to see God doing miraculous things that only God can do. Do you serve a miraculous God? Do you believe that? Right? You believe a God that still does miracles on the earth today. Amen. God didn't quit doing miracles in, in the book of Acts. I've seen miracles with my own eyes. I've, I've prayed for people uh, and seen God do miraculous things. There's people in the church here uh, that have had miracles happen to them. So God is still in the business of meeting us where we're at. God is still in the business of healing us. Amen. I mean, we pray for people when they're, uh, when they're, when they're sick for a reason because we believe that God's going to do something. Amen. We don't just do it because of tradition. We know that God is going to meet us uh, where we're at. So Chapter 2 ended with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, getting promotions, uh, and Daniel getting promotions uh, within the kingdom. Daniel is, is raised to the chief administrator over all the wise men in Babylon. And really, he's become the ruler over the entire province. And then Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego are made, uh, are made to work underneath him. They're, they're put in as administrators as well to help govern, uh, govern because Daniel then goes to the royal court and stays by King Nebuchadnezzar. And I think after King Nebuchadnezzar had ordered his death, that he wanted to stay pretty close to him and make sure he didn't make any uh, decisions like that again. So these guys have all been given uh, a promotion, and Daniel's now in the high court giving counsel. He's the ruler over all this stuff under King Nebuchadnezzar, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are underneath Daniel. So we're going to pick that up. I just want to start in chapter 2, verses 48 and 49, and then we'll move right into chapter 3. It'll kind of pull us, I think, all together as we go through this this morning. I've titled this Facing the Fiery Furnace. So that's kind of a, a cool picture uh, that we have this morning uh, to depict what's happening in this story. All right, verse 48. It says, Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon, as well as chief over all the wise men. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of the affairs of the province of Babylon while Daniel remained in the king's court. Chapter 3, verse 1. 
King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. This thing's pretty big, you know. 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, the first thing when you read this is you kind of think, what an interesting way to start the chapter, right? Because King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 had just seen a demonstration of the power of God. He had, uh, God had just revealed himself to him uh, in the fact that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had prayed. God revealed what the king had dreamed and then revealed the, the interpretation of that dream. They've given that to King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he's just seen God's power and glory and now he's setting up this gigantic statue for worship, 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. This thing is massive. It is huge. Uh, the interesting thing with this chapter is that it doesn't really uh, start on any cr uh, clear chronological timeline. So when you dig in and you read commentaries on this, it is thought that anywhere from 2 to 10 to possibly even 20 years has passed. Okay, so sometimes when we read the Bible, uh, you know, we read from one chapter to the next, but sometimes there's a time frame that goes in there. And, and really, whether it was you know, two months or two years or 10 years or 20 years, uh, it, you know, it really doesn't matter. And it's, it's not one of those things to, you know, one of those things to, to worry about too much. But there has been a period of time that has passed. Because otherwise, when you first read this, you're like, well, that's kind of weird, right? I mean, he just got done saying that Daniel's God is the Lord over kings and he's the God above all of other gods. And then he sets up the statue to worship. But that's because there's not really, uh, we're not sure what that time frame was, but there's some time that has passed since the events of chapter two. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they know King Nebuchadnezzar. They've been ruling underneath his authority. They've been over the affairs within Babylon there in the province. And so now King Nebuchadnezzar does this. It's not like, he has the interpretation from Daniel one day, and then the next day he starts building the statue. So, you know, that's what's going on here uh, at this point. In verse 47 of Daniel chapter 2, we actually saw how King Nebuchadnezzar realized the greatness of God. He said, uh, truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. So again, King Nebuchadnezzar knows how, how powerful God is, but you have to remember he's still a pagan king. There's, there's nothing's recorded in scripture that he gave his life to, to God, that he's following God. He is still a pagan king, and Babylon's uh, religious culture uh, was one where statues were worshipped. They worshipped things that they could see. So uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has probably made the idol that he saw in his dream. That's what they're thinking that this idol was. It was what he had seen in his dream. Uh, but this time, the interesting thing is, what was the, sta what was the entire statue made of? Gold. What was made of gold in his dream, for those of you that were here? The head, right? Was there any part of the, and then it went from head, then the, the chest was made of silver, and then the thighs and, and the waist area, that was made of bronze, and the legs were made of, yeah, right, of iron and clay, okay, so you see, you see here, King Nebuchadnezzar has probably made the image that he, has, that he had dreamed, but now he's made the entire image of gold. It's kind of like he's trying to change the outcome of the dream. I mean, even though he got the dream, do you really think that a king wants to hear that his kingdom and empire is going to come to an end? And hear about the, 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 the empires, the, the kingdoms are going to come. They're going to conquer his and follow. So it's almost like he's trying his best to change uh, the dream because in his dream only the head was made of gold. And so now the whole statue is made of gold. And again, I'm going to guess it's probably gold plated. I mean, who's got like 90 feet of gold and nine feet wide? And I mean, you know, just give me an ear off that thing and I'll live happily the rest of my life. I mean, that's, that, thing is, that thing is massive. So uh, he's probably got this big gold plated statue uh, that he has put in place uh, at this time. Biblical scholars have a few reasons 
uh, as to why he may have made this idol. One, uh, it could have been a strategy to unite the nation. You know, he's got this vast empire. So by centralizing uh, the worship and making a unified religion, he could be trying to bring everybody together under one religion and uh, in a form of, of centralized worship. Secondly, symbolically, uh, he's trying to say that his kingdom is going to be the kingdom that's going to last forever. It's almost like he's trying to deify himself because what was the end result of his dream for those that listened online or here? Whose kingdom is going to last forever? Who you know whose kingdom is going to last forever? Yeah, the Lord's kingdom, God's kingdom, Jesus' kingdom. That's the kingdom that's going to last forever. And so that's something that we always have to remember even now. No matter what's happening in the world, in the United States, anywhere, God is on his throne, amen? And God is in charge and God is in control. And as long as we know Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our life, we know we're going to spend eternity because his kingdom never ends, amen? All right. That's worth yelling, shouting amen for. All right, third, Babylonian records show that there was a revolt during King Nebuchadnezzar during his 10th tenth, uh, tenth year of his reign. And so he could have done this again as a loyalty test to try to bring people back underneath his rulership. So he had a bit of a, a revolt against them. And so any or all of these things are, are reasons why biblical scholars believe King Nebuchadnezzar would have built the statue. And it makes sense that he would have built the statue that was part of his dream. And then in his way, not wanting this prophecy to be fulfilled, he made the statue completely of gold as opposed to the way that it was in his dream. All right, verse 4. Then a herald shouted, People of all races and nations and language, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the, zi the zi zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. I think he wants people to bow down, you know, I mean, throw them into a blazing furnace. Verse 7, so at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All right, so they believe that there are over 300,000 people that have gathered for this. And we read here in scripture that there's all kinds of government officials that have been gathered here. Verse 2 told us that there were high officers, other officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, all the provincial uh, officials had come for this dedication as the king has called them there. And so these are all people that are in extremely high leadership positions uh, throughout the land. Now you have to remember, outside of the nation of Israel, idol worship is normal. They're used to creating statues. They're used to creating their gods, their man-made gods that they can see. So this is very, very normal for them. So we see that, these, that the people that were non-Jewish here, they bowed down to the statue. But the Jews that were there, they didn't bow down. And, and really, how many Jews were there in high leadership positions? The only four that we know about are Daniel Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because these guys have all been taken captive. Usually don't take captives and then put them over the province, right? I mean, God has shown their favor. They've been faithful to God, and so this is what's happened. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they, you know, they don't bow, they don't bow down uh, to this God. Now, an obvious question here is, where is Daniel. You know, that's one of the first things. I'm like, okay, so where's Daniel? They start studying the story. And so it's thought that he could have still been in the royal court. He could have been away on business. Uh, he could have been doing something else. Or because of his high standing really underneath the king, maybe this didn't apply to him. And so, but really, again, it's one of those things that, that, that doesn't really matter because what would Daniel have done if he'd have been there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Would he have bowed down to the idol? No, he wouldn't have. We've already seen his character. We've seen his, his, his integrity. We know his, his reputation from what's happened in Scripture already. So why Daniel's not there, I don't know. That's, we can ask him one day when we get to heaven. You know, where were you? You know, I mean, you left your buddies high and dry. Uh, but anyways, we know he's not there. We don't know where he's at. So verse 8, let's keep moving. It says, but some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. In other words, they ratted him out. They still had tattletales in the Bible time here. Uh, verse 9, it says, They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. You issued, issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, 
the lyre, the harp, the, the, the pipes, and the other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. My first point this morning is this. Sometimes serving God requires a bold stand. Sometimes serving God is going to require a bold stand, a stand where you're going to stand out from everybody else. You're going to stand out above the crowd. And times and situations like that can make you nervous. Have you ever been nervous to make a stand for God? I have in, in my life. There's been times you're like, oh, we'll see where this goes or how will, will people respond to this. Or in this case, a stand for Christ can literally cost them their life because uh, the king has ordered this. So by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not doing this, really according to the laws of the time, they've really committed an act of treason against the king. And treason is punishable by death. And the king has already said, anybody who does not do this is going to be put into this, you know, this, this blazing fiery furnace, and they're going to die for not doing what I've told them to do. All right, verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. I love the adjectives here. He flew in, anybody ever, no, you don't have to raise your hand if you flew into a rage. You know, we've probably all been there, right? And, uh, so he flew into a rage and he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue that I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing fires, the, the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? little power struggle going on here, you know, between God and King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, he realized that, 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 that Daniel's God was the Lord over all other gods and the, the God above all other gods and Lord other kings, but yet he's now created this idol of his dreams. It's all in gold and wanting to be this kingdom that lasts forever. So he's got, again, he's still a pagan king. He's not actually surrendered his life to God. And so uh, this, is, this is what he says that they're going to, you know, they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace uh, right away. And who is going to rescue you from my power? You know, he's taking, trying to take control here. All right, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown in the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Talk about faith. Talk about a faith moment. Talk about a faith step. But before we get there, let's first talk about this blazing, fiery furnace. You know, this is something that they would have had that they could have um, heated up metals within and melted down metals. It's something that they could have had uh, where they, they maybe would have smelted gold uh, or it's a place that they could have cooked bricks. You know, you take clay and, and straw and you cook these bricks. And, and actually, we saw something like this when we were in... Uh, when we were in Africa, uh, when we were in Uganda on our mission trip in 2016, one of the pastors there, uh, part of the ways he was building all of his buildings is he had a business and they, were, they would sell uh, clay, they would sell their bricks, they'd make the clay and they'd fire the bricks and we actually, he took us at one point to the place where they made the bricks to show us his business and then they employed people and there was a bunch of the bricks that were, that were there that had been discarded, they were, they were black, they'd been cooked too hot or for too long and, and if you don't know what happened, when you cook a brick too hot or too long, what happens to it? It becomes brittle, and it was, and it was no good, and they just break apart. So there's that, that process in the fire where too much is not good and, and not enough is, is also not good. And so uh, it would have been a big furnace-type place where you could do a lot of things uh, like this. And so this was a sizable furnace. It's something that could be made incredibly hot to kill someone immediately, which, I mean, 
if you throw anyone into a fire, you're going to die anyways, all right? I mean, it's just, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be burned alive. But he makes this big furnace. It's all heated up. It's all ready to go. It's probably an, an act of intimidation for anybody who decides not to bow down. So the king asked this in verse 14, and this is really interesting. He says, is it true? Almost like at first he was hoping it wasn't. Like these guys, something had happened, you know? Maybe, maybe they had a bad knee and they just couldn't get down that day, you know? Old age issues, whatever. Is this true? Almost, almost like he's, he's hoping that this isn't true. And then, and then after he says, is this, is this true? He wants to give them a chance to make it right. He, he, he said immediately, if you don't do this, you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. But he gives them a second chance. You know, these guys were his administrators in Babylon. He they served him and he trusted them. I mean, if you trust someone to oversee your kingdom, you probably have a relationship with them, right? So these aren't just strangers to King Nebuchadnezzar. These are probably people that he liked as much as a king would probably like people. I don't know how much kings, but they just seem so, you know, above everybody else when you read about him. I'm not sure what his, his personal relationships look like, but he probably liked these guys. He knew these guys. There's relationships there. He's trusted these guys because he trusts Daniel. And so they, they're, they're administrators over, uh, over Babylon there. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they make a bold stand. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, could we make a stand like this for God? What a, what a question to ask ourselves. If, if life and death hang in the balance and, and there's almost certain death with something in front of us, in this case a fiery furnace, would we make a stand like that for God? You know, it would have been easy for them to make excuses and to, to rationalize why a, st- excuse me, a stand like this wasn't necessary. It would, it would have been easy to say, well, You know, just this one time we'll do it to appease King Nebuchadnezzar because how could we serve and be God's hands in this area and serve the Lord if we're dead? Anyone ever rationalize something like that in your life, in your relationship with God? It's it's, it's easy to do in smaller things in life, let alone when life and death hang in the balance. Or, you know, they could have said, well, we're not really become idol worshipers. We worship God. So is one time really going to hurt? Ever, you know, said that before? Well, just one time. It's not really, God's not going to mind too much. You know, it's so easy to make excuses and, and, and to do this. But if they would have done this, they would have, they would have uh, made an excuse for idolatry. They would have made an excuse to sin and rationalize sin in your life. Church, sometimes it's all too easy to rationalize sin in our life. And we can do this in so many ways, in uh, uh, different ways. And I bet if I ask for a raise of hands right now, and I won't, that if you've ever rationalized sin in your life, I bet everybody's hands would go up, maybe both would go up. You know, we've all rationalized sin in our life at times. That's why stories like this are so encouraging. Because here we see three men that that lived out their faith. They lived out their relationship with God. And again, facing certain death, unless God intervenes and does the miraculous only God can do, they are going to die, but they don't do that. These guys don't even take the second opportunity to extend their life a little bit longer, to have the opportunity to bow down. The response that they give to the, to the king when, he get, when they give the second chance is one of the greatest statements of faith in all the Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had no idea what was going to happen to them. They didn't know if they were going to survive the, the fire, but they did know that they served a God that does the miraculous. Amen. They made this, this bold stand before the king, not to defy the king, not to defy the king's authority, but because they live for God. And that's the kind of faith that we need to display to the world as the church of Christ in the world today. These guys were condemned to die for their faith. And so here's a question. Where are you at in your faith today? If you're a follower of Christ, are you willing to potentially die for your faith in Christ. Again, you don't have to give me the answer. Those are personal questions that we need to ask ourselves. Where are we at in our relationship with Jesus? Do we believe that God is, is a God of his word? Do we believe that God is in control of our, uh, of our life? Do we really believe in the things that we say? And would we deny Christ 
or will we stand for Christ? Good questions to ask ourselves. Are you willing to make a stand and to stand out for Christ if necessary? Because standing up for Christ, standing up for right and wrong, standing up for, for biblical truth and for, for biblical morals and values sometimes can be painful. Maybe you've lost a friendship over it. Maybe you've, maybe you've lost a job uh, over that. Maybe you've been made fun of or maybe you've been persecuted. These are all things that can happen when we stand up and sometimes stand out and make a stand for Christ. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego publicly lived out their faith. They, they publicly declared their faithfulness to God above the false gods of the king. Look what it says in verse 17. It says, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. Now, the word that is used here for the phrase for is able is a word from Aramaic that is yesiziv, Y-E-S-E-Z-I-V. And what it means is that God can rescue, that he is, that he is able to to rescue. So in this context, they are saying it is possible that our God can rescue them, but it's not a word that shows certainty. You know, does that make sense? So they're saying our God is able to do this, not that our God is going to do this. He is able to do this, but they don't have a sense of certainty. They don't know for sure that God's going to miraculously save them if you're thrown into a fiery pit. I mean, if I asked you today, if I throw you into a fire, will, God, will your God save you? He is able. <laughs> Some of you look at me like, please don't throw me. Yeah. All we have is a campfire ring out there. No need to worry. All right. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not throwing anybody in the fire. But again, there's, but we believe God's able, right? Right. But do you know? Do you know? We don't, we don't know that God's going to actively do that, but we know that God is able. And so they're a lot like us. They know that God can do it, but they don't have any, any guarantees. And so the decision not to bow down shows great faith. It shows tremendous trust in God, knowing that God is sovereign, knowing that God is over all. They choose to remain faithful to God. They give this answer to, to the king, which can result in certain death, immediate death, unless God does the unthinkable, the unimaginable, the unexplainable, and saves them from this, from this fiery furnace. All right, I'm a little excited. All right, move on. Verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. You know that rage where the blood vessels pop on the top of your head and your nose and your lips, and he's just like, he is, you can just picture this. He is distorted in rage. He is so mad. In front of all these people, they're, they're, they're showing him up and they're not listening and they're defying, they're committing this act of treason before him. So he's angry, his eyes are wide, he's crazy. It says, he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. This thing is hot. This, is, this, is, this, is, this thing is hot. Verse 20 uh, it says, then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army. These are some big guys to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, their turbans, their robes, and their other garments. I, I, I just love how the Bible, uh, just God throws these extra things in to understand. We have the full picture, okay? These guys are fully clothed, okay? Head to toe, they got their turbans on, they got their clothes on, uh, they, are, they are ready to go, <clears throat> Verse 22, and because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers that threw the three men in. So this is hot. You can't even get close enough to throw people into it because you're going to die. It's that hot. So these, this is what happens. Verse 23, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. So can you picture this? You know, and we have a king that we already know from reading in the last couple of weeks has a temper. And he acts very irrationally when he's fearful and when he's in one of his rages. And so the king acts in such a reckless 
way here. He's so angry. He's so upset. He goes from kind of being hopeful that this isn't true to now because it is. He's so angry. He's so upset. He's so mad that he has the fire heated up so much that it kills the soldiers that throw them into it. I mean, this thing is not just a little campfire. This thing is a blazing inferno at this point. So verse 24. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed and the fourth looks like a god. Imagine his amazement. See, Sometimes we think that if we love God, if we serve God, if we've given our life to God, that bad things shouldn't happen to us. That we shouldn't have to walk through the fire. We sang that in the last song today. It really ties into this message really well. We don't have to walk through the fire in life. I think many Christians today would have wondered why God was allowing this to happen to them after they've been faithful. They've done all that God had, had, had commanded them to do. They didn't drink the choice wine or eat the king's food, and, and that could have resulted in death. And they went through all the training and did all these things. And now here, uh, then they find themselves at a life or death moment with, with having to give the king what he dreamed and then the interpretation of the dream. And then here again, they find themselves in a life or death moment. Anyone else just want to have a pity party with God? You know, these guys had every reason. Again, we talked about that last week, to have a pity party with God. And oftentimes we think that if we've given our life to Christ, that life's just going to be easy. Guys, sometimes life is hard. You know, in some ways, my life is just is great right now. My, I, I, got my, I got great kids and a wife and, and, uh, and, and church is going well. But there's other areas of my life that are just really hard right now. You know, I just lost my grandfather a month and a half ago. I lost my mom this year. Dad's not. I mean, there's, there's a lot of hard things going on in my life. It would be really easy to have a pity party. Really easy to go, oh, God, why are you allowing all these things to happen? But, you know, what do we sing about this morning? He'll walk with us through the fires. Amen? He'll be there with us. He's going to go with us. He's going to go before us. God never promises us as Christians a life free of trials. He never promised us in life a life free of, of, of all the different fires and problems that we go through us. He never promises to spare us from the fires of life. But what God does promise is that he'll be there with us. That God will never leave us or abandon us. Amen. No matter what we go through. And we, we sang about that this morning. We, we declared that to God. You know, a Christian slogan that people used to say all the time uh, when I was growing up, and, and sometimes you still hear it today, is the safest place to be is in the will of God. You ever heard that? Yeah. I don't believe that at all. Now, let me tell you why. I don't believe that because I believe the best place to be is in the will of God. But I've been in a lot of places in the will of God that were not very safe. I can think of some places, especially on missions trips in third world countries where I have had myself in, in, in some very sketchy places and the adjective of uh, best place or, or safest place to be would not be the adjective that I would use to describe those locations in those times with God. Now, the best place to be is in the will of God, but that does not always mean it's going to be physically the safest, you know? And so again, uh, the, the, the safest place to be in the will of God? No. The best place is the will of God, though, because God's going to... I'd rather be in a very sketchy situation in the best place with the will of God, because that's where he has me, than sitting at home in my living room, and you hear people, a gunshot goes through the wall and kills someone sitting in their chair or on their sofa. You're in a safe place. I'd rather be where God wants me to be in a sketchy place than in a safe place where he doesn't want me to be. Amen? And so the best place to be is in the will of God. It does not mean it's always the safest place. And so we've got to get over that as Christians sometimes. We think, oh, I'm doing what God wants me to do, so life's just going to be easy. It's not, it's not always going to be the case. Praise God for those times, okay? But that doesn't mean that that's, that's not what he's promised us. All right, verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the, of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than to serve or worship any God except their God. That's coming right out of his mouth. Praise God, you defied my orders. You just proved again how amazing and real your God is. You can, you can sense the amazement and the shock that King Nebuchadnezzar has here. He jumps, he jumps from his seat. You know, he's in shock, amazement. It's almost like he's just been sitting there, you know, almost entertained, ready for them to die because of their, their treason. But not only do they not die, but the ropes burn off. But those are the only things that burn off. Right? Their clothes are, are, are still there. Not a hair on their head uh, had been harmed in any way. And there are now four people walking around. God has sent an angel. Maybe it was Jesus himself. It looked like a God to King Nebuchadnezzar. Again, that's one of those things. We're going to have movie night in heaven, I hope. We can see this played out. And we're going to one day know exactly who it was. Again, it doesn't matter if it's Jesus or an angel or, you know, whoever it was. God, has, God is present with them in the fire. Amen. So the king gets as close as he can, it says here, here to the door, without dying himself, because he's made this thing seven times hotter, and he tells them to get out of the fire. And what does he do right away? He refers to them as servants of the Most High God. Once again, King Nebuchadnezzar sees that the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the God over all other gods. And he sees that the fire had no power because they serve the God that created the universe. And church, you serve the God that created the universe. The, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives and dwells in us. And we have that in our life. We have, we have that power. And so not only were they saved, which, I mean, if that's not amazing enough, not a hair on their head was harmed. And, and, and they still had their clothing. And they didn't even smell of smoke. Guys, that alone's a miracle. I can't even have a campfire without going in. My wife goes, you smell like smoke. Go take a shower. Lay down at night, she's like, you smell too much like smoke. I can't even have a campfire. These guys are in an inferno. They got all their clothes on. They don't even smell of smoke. And the only thing that's burned off are the ropes that were binding them. These guys have shown King Nebuchadnezzar God's power. He's shown, they've shown the nation the power of God. Remember, it's a pagan nation and a pagan King, my last point this morning as we close is we need to trust God in every situation in life. That, that can be hard to do sometimes, especially when we go through trying times. Sometimes we just want to give up. Maybe we want to throw in the towel. Uh, maybe we want to have a pity party. Maybe we want to do anything but pray. Man, we, we learn here in Scripture to go deeper with God, to press in with, in with God, to, to, to take an even stronger stand, to, to double down like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, no, our God is the one true God, and we're going to live lives that glorify him, even if it costs us our life. What an, a powerful example they are to us to trust God in every situation and make a stand for Christ no matter what. I mean, they had no guarantees that God was going to save them from this fire. We read of no prophetic dreams. We read of no uh, angelic visitations. Again, we read that word in, Ar in Aramaic that, that meant that God is able. It doesn't mean that they had certainty that they had heard that God would do this for them. All they knew is that they would not bow their knee to any God but the one true God. And may we as a church, may we as God's people not bow our knee to anyone but the one true God. Church, we've got to look at what idols do we have in our life. What things do we bow our name to in the name of entertainment, in the name of pleasure, in the name of fun, in the name of success, that, that really is a form of idolatry in our life? We have, we have to ask God those things. Is there anything that we place before you in our life? You know, sometimes we would rather see the fire removed from us than to walk through the fire. But that, refire, that fire is a refining process as we go through it in our relationship with God. All right, last two verses, 29 and 30. King Nebuchadnezzar says, Therefore I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God that can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. 
And my first thought here is he kind of has this desire to tear people limb from limb. We, we, we heard, we've heard this the last couple of weeks. And to destroy their houses and mess up their families' lives even more while he's at it. So um, don't mess with the king. He'll, just, he'll tear you limb from limb. Uh, but King Nebuchadnezzar, I think it's really interesting to, 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 to point out here, if we can put that verse back up, uh, he doesn't make a commitment to God. Now, I want to be clear on this. He doesn't, he doesn't make a commitment to God himself. What he, what he does say is he acknowledges God's power and says that no one should speak against their God. So he's still, he's still a pagan king in a pagan culture. He doesn't surrender to God himself, but he realizes that when it comes to God, you know, it's like God and then, you know, kings. He's, he's still putting them above him, but he's not surrendering uh, to, to Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's gone. And then it says they're promoted and rewarded for their faith and for their righteousness. They're given even more authority. I have no idea what those jobs, how you can even get more powerful uh, than what they had, but they were promoted and, uh, and, and, and were blessed uh, for what they had done. Church, when we go through hard times, when we uh, face the fiery furnaces uh, in life, we need to make sure that no matter what's happening, that we seek to glorify God through those times. That we don't give up, that we don't quit, that we don't give in, but that we press on. Church, we've got to press on in life. The church uh, needs to be bold in the earth today. The church needs to stand for truth. The church needs to stand for the word of God and what God says. It doesn't matter what popular culture says. It doesn't matter what laws man makes. If, if, if they go against the word of God, then that's not where we go, amen? It doesn't matter if, if, if the world says something is okay. And so we need to be willing to make those stands and we need to be willing to do and to go where God calls us to do and to face those fiery trials in life knowing that God goes with us. We don't go alone, but to stand up for our faith and to make a difference because the world is searching for truth. The world is searching for hope and all of us are representatives of God's love, God's peace, and God's hope to everyone we come in contact with. And God is moving, guys. I'm seeing God do some amazing things in people's lives right now. I'm seeing God grab hold of people in radical ways and I'm believing that God's gonna keep doing amazing things. I'm believing for a revival on this planet, amen? We need it. We need to see God keep doing. And so we are the hands and feet of Christ. So guys, we've got a job to do. When we leave these doors every week, the week just starts. Okay, amen? The week just starts. It's our, ch our chance to go out into the world and be ministers for Christ. All of us are ministers for Christ. We all have the job to minister to the people that God brings us in contact with. Amen? All right, I want you to stand on your feet. We will close in prayer. Great story, isn't it? There's so many things that we can take from it, and there's so many things we can learn. God's word is true, and it's alive, and there's so much we can learn for our lives today from it. And I hope you've seen in the series just how fun it is to read it. So I encourage you, spend time in God's word and, and read and study it and see what God shows you. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, and we're so thankful that we can... We have your word, Lord, that we have Bibles, that we can, we, we don't have to worry about being uh, arrested for having Bibles, and, and God, that we can read them, and God, so help us to take advantage of that. Help us, give us hearts for you, give us hearts to study and to learn and to want to grow more, and, and God, just pray for what we've studied and looked at the last four weeks, God, that you just seal that in our hearts, God, that you'd give us uh, a, a bold faith that's willing to make a stand, that's willing to stand out, uh, that's willing to live for you above uh, all other things, God, that, that we wouldn't compromise in our lives. It's so easy to find ourselves in, in compromise. And if we find ourselves there, God, that we'd repent. God, that we'd change, that we turn, and that we would put you first and foremost in, in how we live our life, that we would live for you. God, use all of us for your glory and for your, and, and for your purpose. We pray for peace upon everyone here this morning. God, we pray for just divine appointments to share your love with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Again, don't forget to sign up out in the, the foyer for the blood drive. Also, if you are a guest uh, and new with us, we have connection cards out there. We'd love to know who you are and uh, be able to follow up with you. If you could check out the Welcome Center, there's coffee there as well. God bless you. Go in peace and have a great week.